few facilitators today. Um, Holly Hagel is the director of the National Expert ATTC and has been actively working with providers since joining IRETA in 2003. Brett Harris is project evaluator of the federally funded New York State Expert Cooperative Agreement, which delivers expert and STD clinics and tuberculosis chest centers in New York City and emergency departments, and a federally qualified health center. And Tracy McPherson is a senior research scientist at NORC at the University of Chicago. And she co-leads the Brief Intervention Group initiative aimed at changing the way employee assistants and providers of behavioral health care services assess and intervene for substance abuse. Okay. Now before we get started, I just have a few questions. Um, we like to get to know our audience, so I'm going to run through those now. Uh, what you'll see is a blue box that pops up on your screen, and we do ask that you respond to that poll question just so we can get some understanding of our audience. Um, the first question is, what is your, prof your current professional role? Great, thank you. The next question is, what field do you represent? Great, thank you. Next we ask, do you conduct expert interventions? <coughs> Great, thank you. Then, do you see your agency using SBIRT? Thank you. And finally, in which settings are you most likely to implement SBIRT or assist others to implement SBIRT for youth? Great, thank you. All right, at this time I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Hagel to get us started. Well, thank you very much, Danielle, and uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Uh, I just find the polls always a little fascinating and insightful, and I hope it helps the other two speakers. Um, you know, sort of tailor uh, the comments around uh, SBIRT. This is intended to be a learning community, so hopefully many of you are returning, and that means that you came to the first one that we held over a month ago. And um, we're building a community of learners around screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment, um, focused on youth, and that uh, was purposeful that we said youth, because it's not just uh, school age, K through 12, or college that we're focusing. We're focusing on students who might have graduated from high school and are in the workforce or not in the workforce or in higher ed. So we broadly want to address youth and the application of screening brief intervention. Uh, so just let me, I just really got the lucky part uh, to introduce the National ATTC, which I did on the last webinar, uh, Learning Community. So if you attended, it seems redundant, but I wanted to remind you that we have all of these resources that we spent the last two years developing 
to build um, you know, the resources around SBIRT, not just for youth, but also for adults. So please visit our website and, and take advantage of all these products, the toolkits, um, online courses, digital um, tours of information and resources, and also our expert alert, which is just our electronic newsletter, which keeps you up to date on the current, you know, trainings and um, also what's in the literature on expert. Uh, we get almost a daily Google alert about something going on with expert across the country. So, and then um, our blog post uh, shares stories about how experts implemented in the real world. And storytelling is still a valid way of learning how to do things, so enjoy the stories. I wanted to highlight um, that we have a national conference coming up this June, uh, June 9th and 10th, and you can register and find out more about our conference. There's two tracks, so if people um, don't know anything about SBIRT, we have an SBIRT 101 track, but if you're a very practiced uh, practitioner of SBIRT or researcher and you want to learn about uh, the current aspects of uh, expert in special populations or s specific substances, you'll visit, uh, you'll enjoy, there'll be something for you too, a separate track. Um, the other thing about this conference is that we are um, demonstrating expert and the use of expert as an educational to tool through standardized um, patients and simulation. So uh, hopefully, if you want, you can attend our conference and visit sunny Pittsburgh. It is sunny in June in Pittsburgh. And then finally, we have uh, two self-paced courses. Of course, this is focused on youth, so this expert for adolescents is the one that you might most be interested in. And that means uh, self-paced means you can start and stop it at any point. You can do it on Sunday morning and then come back to it on Tuesday and pick up where you left off to, until you complete it. And you can also earn up to three CEUs. And then we don't have it on this slide, but we do have um, uh, Expert 101, which is a, uh, you can earn up to 10 hours of CEUs learning each of the in-depth components for Expert, uh, and that is more focused on the adult population, but it is the entire Expert model. That's all I have to say today. I'm really happy that uh, we have Dr. Brad Harris and Dr. Tracy McPherson. This is both their specialty areas, understanding um, screening instruments, and I look forward to learning from them today as well as the rest of you. So, Brett, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, as soon as I open up the panel and change presenter. There you go. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Hagel. So, um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon or this morning. And um, this is, should be a very interesting presentation because um, you know, we want to stress the importance of using a standardized tool, but also to um, identify a few of them for you and show you, walk, them, walk you through them um, question by question and show you how to score them and interpret them. So um, without further delay, um, just to give a little bit of background, adolescent screening and um, has been uh, recommended by various organizations and substance abuse and um, numerous, uh, and, uh, you know, as you can see, uh, these are the main um, uh, organizations uh, in substance abuse and as well as in public health. And guidelines have been um, given for uh, how to, um, what screening tools and in some cases use and how to um, interpret them, which we'll be covering a little bit later in the presentation. So what is actually happening? So in terms of um, pediatric settings, who's screening, how much, uh, how many adolescents are being screened, um, studies have shown that um, pediatricians are only reporting you know, less than half, 32 to 45 percent, routine alcohol screening. Um, actually, a study I conducted in New York State school-based health centers, only 50 percent of the clinicians um, reported um, doing uh, even asking about substance use. And I say they don't even conduct informal screening. They're not even asking whether um, they're using alcohol or drugs. So um, also in my study, I found that screening using a standardized tool was reported with the least regularity when compared to all other expert model components. So this is including um, asking about substance use uh, includes um, assessing um, behavior change, readiness to change, uh, advising students to change, 
and um, providing referrals to treatment. So in, uh, in terms of using specific standardized tools, the study found um, among Massachusetts pediatricians, only 34% reported using the CRAF. Um, more than half reported informal screening without using a screening tool. 8% used the CAGE. And um, you know, just to give you some background, the CAGE detects substance dependence and for old, you know, more adult populations rather than adolescents, especially younger adolescents. And 5% um, use larger health or social assessments. So that would be something like the, the gaps or the wraps through the head. Um, in my study, similar results were found in the New York State School-Based Health Center. Only 22% reported using the CRAF. And, um, you know, 63% reported using the GAPS and another 35% the RAP through the head. Once again, the health and social assessment. 20% um, conducted informal screening using no screening tool. 13% used the CAGE and 8% used uh, other screening instruments um, that are recommended for adults. That's the audit for alcohol, the DAS for drugs, and the assist for both. So uh, it looks like a lot of um, you know, pediatric setting, settings, and especially in school-based health centers, do use um, health and social assessments. And I'll, I'll give you an example. And they do ask about substance use. They also ask about many other health conditions. The Rapid Assessment for Alcohol Preventive Services, which is the RAP, is used in a number of our school-based health centers in New York State as well as nationwide. And I pulled out the alcohol and drug questions. So you can see that there are, um, there are four questions here and um, varies between in the past 12 months and the past three months. Um, and it's a yes-no response. And of course, this is asked with a number, you know, it's over 20 questions, a number of other questions. So what do you do now? So if you're a provider and you ask these questions and um, an adolescent says yes to one of them, what do you do? Is that, um, how do you know if it's problematic? So how do you interpret the responses to these questions? So, um, you know, unfortunately, with the RAP, there is no specific algorithm um, for you know detecting an issue. So, is, if, it's, if an adolescent says yes, does, does that mean that there is an issue that needs to be addressed with a brief intervention or with a referral to treatment? What level of intervention needs to be provided? So a standardized tool provides an evidence-based algorithm for the provision of the appropriate services and takes the guessing game out of identifying problem substance use. So using a standardized tool will result in higher detection of problem substance use and is the best practice. Um, otherwise, you're um, leaving it up to clinical impressions of the provider and many um, adolescents could be missed in that case. So just to stress about relying on clinical impressions, it often leads to a failure to identify and address problem use. So um, this slide shows a study that um, compares clinical impressions to an adolescent diagnostic interview to detect use. And you can see here that the clinical impressions um, led to a lot fewer, you know, far fewer identification in the actual interview. Uh, whereas problem use was identified in over 100 adolescents using the interview, only 18 were identified with problem use based on clinical impressions of the provider. And then for substance abuse, 50 adolescents were identified, whereas only 10 were identified based on clinical impressions. Then for substance dependence, none were identified for uh, clinical uh, or for uh, by clinical impressions. So um, just using a standardized tool does not guarantee the identification and intervention with risky users. So what we are going to do is introduce a number of screening instruments that also show you how to score them. And then after you score them, what does that score mean? So uh, how do you know what uh, type of intervention to provide based on the screening score? So just to provide an example, um, a research study has showed that um, in a sample of youth, which 14% uh, scored positive on the CRAF, pediatricians only identified 5% with problem use based on their own impressions, 
but of that 5%, almost 20% were still not recommended for intervention. So hopefully we'll be able to help provide the tools today um, to uh, you know, show you the importance of these tools, how to score them, and how to interpret them. So first, you know, I've talked a number of times about the craft, and I think that the people on this um, webinar, uh, a lot of them, Hilton grantees doing Expert with Adolescents probably are familiar with what the craft is, so I guess I didn't you know, describe it earlier, but here I'm going to go um, through um, and introduce you to the craft and how to score it. So the CRAFT is a validated screening tool for use with adolescent patients, and it uh, screens for both alcohol and drugs. There are three uh, uh, questions in Part A and six in Part B. So Part A we often refer to as the pre-screen. And um, so based on responses to Part A um, is how you uh, determine which portions of Part B to, uh, to administer. And then there is a scoring al algorithm, as I mentioned. And a positive craft means that the adolescent should be assessed for alcohol and drug abuse or dependence. So this is the craft screening instrument. Um, and this is, uh, it, it provides appropriate skip patterns here. So this is what it looks like if you were to um, print it off. Um, but I'm going to bring you uh, question by question, um, and actually in larger uh, font so you can see it. So um, these are the opening three questions, as I mentioned, the pre-screen, and it's all in the past 12 months. So first, um, did you drink in the past 12 months, did you drink any alcohol, more than a few sips, smoke any marijuana, or use anything else to get high? So if the adolescent answers no to all of these questions, you will then ask the car question in Part B, because the car question is asking whether the adolescent has ever driven while intoxicated or high on some substance or ridden in a car with someone who was intoxicated or um, the, dr the driver was intoxicated or high on some substance. So we need to still assess for that riding risk. Uh, if the adolescent answers yes to any of these questions, all in Part B is going to be asked. So this is Part B and the C-R-A-F-F-T acronym. Uh, stands for car, relax, alone, forget, family or friends, in trouble. Um, so C, have you ever ridden in a car driven by someone, including yourself, who was high or had been using alcohol or drugs? Do you ever use alcohol or drugs to relax, feel better about yourself, or fit in? Do you ever use alcohol or drugs while you were by yourself or alone? Do you ever forget things you did while using alcohol or drugs? Do your family or friends ever tell you that you should cut down on your drinking or drug use? And have you ever gotten into trouble while you were using alcohol or drugs? So in order to score this, um, you add up each yes, and it produces a score. So it's, as you can see, it's very simple. And the, um, uh, the scoring guidelines I'm uh, going to present is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, who provided the guidelines for the craft instrument. Um, so if the adolescent reports no use in Part A, it's referred to a low-risk abstinence. So it was suggested to provide praise and encouragement for making healthy choices and to, of course, give guidance to avoid riding in a car with someone who has been drinking or using drugs. So of course you can see that it's even important to provide some uh, form of prevention intervention for adolescents who are not using at all. Um, if the adolescent reports use in Part A but, and scores a 0 to 1 um, on full craft, it's reported as moderate risk craft negative. So this, just to clarify, a score of 0 to 1 on Part B or on the entire instrument, if a student, remember an adolescent can report no use at all on Part A but still report yes to the car question for that riding risk. So this is referred to as moderate risk. Um, I mean, so I, I've been saying no, it reports use in Part A and scores a 0 to 1. It's moderate risk. So if the adolescent score responds yes to one um, of the CRAFT um, uh, you know, acronym questions, or if the, um, because we know the adolescent can also report use in the past 12 months but not report 
uh, affirmative to any of the questions. It's still moderate risk, PrEP, negative. So even if the craft is negative, there's still you know what we refer to as brief advice that should be provided. So it's to stop using substances, and the provider should also educate the adolescent on the health effects of substance use and the effects it might have on their achievements and their personalities. So kind of relating it to uh, what they like to do, maybe if they're into sports or um, you know into uh, playing an instrument, how this might this use might affect that, and um, try to encourage them to um, stop using. So a PrEP score of two or above is considered a positive. That's a high risk PrEP positive. So the provider should assess for risk or presence of addiction and um, the conviction that the adolescent has for making behavior changes, really um, assessing their readiness to change. And then the provider should um, discuss with the adolescent's history of use, patterns of increasing use, whether they have made quit attempts and whether they've experienced any negative consequences from their use. And um, the provider should also consider scheduling a follow-up appointment and or providing a referral to substance abuse treatment. And of course, as I mentioned, a yes to the car question is referred to as driving risk. And of course, it could also be riding risk. And um, the provider should then encourage a commitment to avoid future driving or riding risk. All right, so at this point, I'm going to hand the controls over to Dr. McPherson to talk about screening for brief intervention. Danielle, can you bring the slides up? Great, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, several uh, screening tools. Some of them uh, you may be familiar with because they've been used uh, with adults, and they are appropriate for the upper range of adolescents, often referred to as young adults. They're still considered adolescents, but they're older adolescents and approaching young adulthood. There are others that are newer, uh, more recent, have come out in uh, the literature, including the F2BI, which uh, stands for Screening to Brief Intervention. So the F2BI is uh, developed uh, by Dr. Sharon Levy at a Boston Children's Hospital. And it's, it's being developed with support uh, by NIDA. And it is a, it's an adaptation of the NIDA quick screen, which many of you may have heard of if you're working with adults. Uh, it's, it's validated for a number of different uh, interview formats, uh, also self-administration. But what's really interesting about this tool is it's been validated in the use of electronic devices, such as tablets. We've heard a lot about the use of tablets and technology with adolescents as a, a way to engage adolescents in screening. And it's something that uh, not as many of the older tools perhaps have been validated on. So this is really exciting and something that you're, you're going to see more of, I think, coming, coming in the future. Now, this is uh, developed with 12 to 17-year-olds in mind. It's really brief to administer. And the nice thing about this tool is that it's available to you uh, online. There's a lot of training and information. There are a lot of resources on the brief intervention. So as you're interpreting the S2BI, what's the proper uh, level of brief intervention, and what actually goes into the brief intervention when you're having a conversation. So I've provided you with a link uh, so you can learn more about that. Now, the S2BI discriminates among four categories of substance use. So there's no past year use, uh, use without a substance use disorder. And this is risk. Um, this is really risk for a substance use disorder, or risk 
um, for a mild or moderate substance use disorder and risk for a severe substance use disorder. And this triage is risk to help you understand the level of risk. Uh, and it does it across uh, a, a range of substances. Now, all the questions are formed around past year use and across eight different categories, including alcohol and tobacco and marijuana, cocaine, and prescription drugs. We'll, we'll show you what those items are in just a minute. And all of the questions are answered using the same response format, never, once or twice, monthly, weekly, almost daily, or daily. So this is the, this is the question. This is the screening question, it's, and it's about frequency. Now, you saw the craft. It was talking about um, uh, experiences work, uh, riding in cars with other individuals who might be drinking or looking at some of the, perhaps, the consequences. This particular screening tool focuses really on frequency. So the first three questions in the past year, how many times have you used tobacco products or alcohol or marijuana? And you ask those individually as three separate questions. Now, with this particular tool, you stop. If the answer is never to all of them, you stop because it hasn't been shown to be predictive. Um, adolescents are less likely to use the other substances if these substances haven't been used in the past year. So in terms of uh, the predictive value, it makes sense to stop here, and um, then you would, you would move on. Say you're, you're going to be uh, administering other kinds of screening tools around anxiety or depression. Uh, if they do uh, say yes, they, or they have used it one or more times in the past year, you would go on to ask about illegal drug use, such as cocaine and ecstasy, prescription drugs, uh, using examples such as Adderall, over-the-counter medications, uh, such as cough medicine for non-medical reasons. And you may have to describe what non-medical reasons mean. That's a common issue in some of the screening tools is, is really helping the adolescent. It's hard enough for adults to understand it, but adolescents uh, also need to understand that it might mean using a medication beyond what was prescribed, uh, using a medication that was not prescribed for them, using a medication for the effect, or getting high. And then you would ask the question about past year use of inhalants and um, herbs or synthetic drugs. With, and this is really, really easy to uh, score and interpret. If you look at the middle column, where it says S2BI score, if there's no use of any substance, that there's essentially no past year use, there's uh, no risk for substance use disorder. And you know, in this particular case, just like in adult models of um, expert, you're going to provide some positive reinforce, uh, reinforcement and encouragement to delay initiation. If the score is once or twice use of any substance in the last year, it it's, uh, doesn't suggest that they're at risk for a substance use disorder, but the score would be interpreted as, 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 um, different, as identifying past year use. So this is a lower level of risk. And the level of intervention is, is typically brief advice um, and encouraging um, abstinence um, or cessation of its tobacco. If, if it's monthly use of any substance, then it's risk for mild or moderate substance use disorder. And the level of intensity of the brief intervention is going to increase. So you're looking at engaging the adolescent in a brief motivational intervention to encourage cessation uh, to reduce use uh, or to abstain. And then the highest level of risk weekly or greater use of any substance is risk for severe substance use disorder. And here, uh, in addition to providing brief motivational interview, uh, intervention to reduce the risk, um, you, you, you would uh, see this as a situation where it would warrant a referral to treatment or connecting the adolescent into a higher level of care through a warm handoff, delivering them to a, a more intensive um, assistance. And in this particular case, um, adolescents with nicotine uh, use may be benefit from uh, tobacco sensation uh, pharmacotherapy. And also with alcohol or an opioid, a potential risk for uh, alcohol or opioid addiction, they may also uh, 
benefit from pharmacotherapy. Now, I wanted to show you this because when you go onto the site and, you're, and, you, and you want to learn more about this, you're going to see a little phrase at, at the end when they present the, the first uh, set of questions I just talked to you about. It says, this does not, this does not um, include all of the questions in the assessment. And uh, if you do a little bit of digging and you look into the, what that means, um, what I found when I went to, to the original article was that oftentimes the brief assessment is paired with that first screening item. So in this particular case, if, you, uh, if the answer was yes to any screening question on that first frequency question, then uh, if you're in, you have the ability to answer the further assessment questions, whether it's you or you're handing off to a colleague or a social worker or a nurse or someone else, they recommend to do a further assessment. And it doesn't have to be necessarily a full diagnostic assessment, although that may be appropriate in your setting, but here's a brief assessment tool that you can pair with the S2BI. And the first section, it says the RAFT, R-A-F-F-T, that comes from the craft that Dr. Harris just covered. It just doesn't have the first car question. Then it, they also uh, suggest uh, digging a little bit deeper into alcohol use. So if they reported using alcohol in the past year uh, once or more, to ask them additional questions, like the number of drinks that they had on, a, on an occasion on three or more days. And you see it says, have you had X or more drinks? And that's interesting because currently a lot of the guidelines suggest that the same uh, number, which is five for men, is often used for adolescent screening tools. So a lot of times you'll see the number five plugged in here, have you had five or more drinks? And so there hasn't been as much attention to pay to what should that X be? What should that number be? Should it be two or three? There are a lot of those things that shouldn't be five, but we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And then just ask a few more questions about blackouts, uh, where they've ha had um, really heavy episodes of drinking, 10 or more drinks, where they've used it in alcohol in combination with other medications. And then to dig a little bit further into marijuana use and asking more frequently about how many times in the past um, two or more weeks. Same with tobacco, asking more about that um, behavior in the last two weeks. So you've gone from one year to really drilling down to something in the more recent um, uh, behaviors. And uh, then digging a little bit further again into 30-day use of the same medications that were in the first frequency question around prescription drugs and et cetera. This is just to help you, if you want to go a bit further, to give you a tool that's been validated with the S2BI. And for we, we uh, uh, and just a minute ago, I shared with you the interpretation using the S2BI and what level of risk that was. And so the first column is the same as the last column was in the last um, interpretation slide that I showed you. But you know, wanted you to, to see that if you decide to go on and do further assessment, there are ways to help you interpret that other level of, 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 of assessment. So I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but certainly it helps you pair the RAF score with the other scores around the two-week use and the 30-day use and to sort of match what level of risk that is. And what Dr. Harris was covering in terms of the level of the brief intervention, that conversation at the lower risk and the moderate risk, that's going to apply the same here. It's going to apply with this, this particular screening tool as well. So the MAAA Youth Guide, this is a relatively, relatively newer guide um, put out by NIAAA. And this is interesting because it really breaks it down into two age-specific screening items, whereas the, some of the other tools are applying all the items to uh, everyone in a particular age range. It breaks it down into asking about friends drinking, and one's own personal drinking. And there's, this is a publicly available document which has all the screening tools and the levels of the brief intervention and more guidance on the brief intervention 
that you are welcome to download. Let's dig in a little bit further to the question. So that you ask two questions, and you'll notice you have elementary, middle school, and high school. And with elementary and middle school, you ask the friends questions first, and then you ask about the adolescent, the patient's um, behavior second. With high schoolers, you ask the about the patient's own use first, and then the friends second. So the elementary school, you're going to ask about use in the past year of alcohol, beer, wine. And, and that time frame is going to be different as you go up to the different age ranges. So it's particularly important to pay attention to the time frames here. So you're, you're going to ask about friends uh, use in the past year. And then you're going to ask the patient, the adolescent, about their use of alcohol in their lifetime ever. And if they've ever used uh, any uh, alcohol, it would be considered high risk. For a middle schooler, you're going to ask the friends question about uh, have their friends uh, drank any of these forms of alcohol in the past year. And then you're going to ask them about their own use uh, in the past year, but it's going to be about how many days in the past year. We're less concerned about ever and more concerned about the last year. And in this range, you're going to get, if someone endorses that they have, it's going to be um, somewhere in the, in the range of moderate to high risk, and we'll break that down a little bit further in a second. And then high schoolers, you're going to ask the patient first about their, their use, how many days in the past year, and that's going to give you a risk range of low, moderate to high. And then you're going to ask the friends question about how many drinks do they typically drink on an occasion. Because binge drinking at this age range increases your, heightens your concern uh, that this person might be at high risk. And then you determine, you say, does, the person, does this patient drink or not drink? And then you go to step two. So this step two is for the patient who does not drink. And so you ask the then you've asked the question, do your friends drink? If it's no, that's going to be on, again, the, the, the lower level of risk, and you're going to prov provide an intervention to that level. If the answer is yes, your fr the friends do drink, it's going to be a higher level of intervention, similar to what Dr. Harris covered a minute ago in the, in the mild to moderate risk. And this completes the screening for the non-drinker, and you would rescreen next year. And this is the chart that you would use um, when you're w working with a patient who does consume alcohol. And you're going to look across this table. For anyone under the age of 11, everything is high risk. But as you go up the age range from 12 to 15 and then up through 18, you look to see, OK, it was a 16-year-old, and they reported 6 to 11 days of risk. That's in the sort of the tan area that individual will be at moderate risk. So the level of intervention would match the level of risk. And so you, you essentially map the age, the number of, of uh, days of drinking, and then it tells you uh, whether the low risk should receive brief advice, the moderate risk should receive brief, intervice, uh, brief advice and motivational interviewing, or motivational interviewing and possible referral for high risk. And that was, you mentioned a minute ago about using the standards for men uh, to apply to the, the questions we ask adolescents. So uh, what we find is that you know, the definition that SAMHSA and, and other agencies use is having five or more drinks on at least one occasion in the past 30 days. Well, we can't do studies with adolescents drinking alcohol for a number of ethical reasons. And so when you um, extrapolate scientifically and look at blood alcohol concentration levels, what you find is that that number really is, is, should be much lower when we're asking adolescents about binge drinking. And so here you see at 9 to 13, 14 to 15, or 16 or more, um, it should be, uh, we should be using a lower number if we want to ask about uh, binge drinking. So we want to keep in mind when we see those questions out there about binge drinking, but making sure that we're asking the right question um, with boys, um, tailored to boys and tailored to girls. And once you get up to 16 or older, that, that is actually the same that you would use for an adult male. Uh, for, for women, it's, it's actually four. So I just wanted to note that so that we're all using the, the best questions that we can. 
Then the global appraisal of individual needs short screener, or the GAIN SS, is the next tool. This is a, a, a validated tool. There is a lot, there's a, just a massive amount of literature out there on this uh, suite of tools. The GAIN has many, many, many different instruments. I'm just going to dive into the substance use disorder screener. Uh, it's, if you go to this website, it has all possible information, training information, normative information, instruction manuals. There's an overwhelming amount of, of information about the validity of this. You don't get, doesn't get a lot of attention, but it really has a lot of, of scientific support. And it can be used for a range of, from adolescents, young adults, and, and further. And it's very easy to administer. It's very quick. Um, and it can be administered in many formats, including the web. And this is, um, is very easy because it has five items, and you're asking about past month, um, behavior within the uh, two to 12 months, one year or more. And you can see it's very similar to the other, the other, some of the other tools asking about um, alcohol and drugs in the same question and asking about the effects of the alcohol or drugs. Um, whether it's caused harm, leading to fights and social problems, um, you know, interfering with activities, withdrawal um, symptoms, very similar to the others. You simply administer it, you uh, mark it, and you, you add up the total. And you, you uh, get a range of risk from low, moderate to high, and it's, you know, at low it's unlikely to have um, lead to a diagnosis. Uh, moderate risk, it's a possible diagnosis, they probably could benefit from further assessment. At high risk, it's likely that there's a possible diagnosis, would need more formal con assessment uh, to confirm, a uh, more intensive level of brief intervention, and potentially um, uh, pharmacotherapy or, or ref and certainly referral. In the NIAAA single item screens, there's one for alcohol, and there's one for drug use. How many times in the past year have you had X or more drinks in a day? This, like I mentioned earlier, this is really for young adults, the five for men and four for women. It's for young adults, and anything um, that a response of one or more is considered positive. Very easy to administer. The next item is very similar. How many times in the past year have you used an illegal drug or used a prescription medication for non-medical reasons? If the answer is one or more, it's considered a positive screen. And these would, um, you can either stop here and provide brief intervention, or you could use this first and then use another tool uh, to follow it to determine whether further screening is needed. And then I'm going to turn it over to back to Dr. Harris, and she's going to talk with you more about screening for comorbid conditions. Thank you, Dr. McPherson. So we've introduced a number of screening tools for substance use. And um, you know, as we talked about earlier about larger health assessments, they cover other health issues, which providers often want to cover. And um, so I'm going to introduce a couple of um, uh, screening tools that can be very, very brief screening tools that can be used for conditions that are very often comorbid with substance use and that have been used um, in um, other expert programs coupled with, um, and, and actually can be coupled with um, any of these um, screening tools that we just introduced. So the first is the patient health questionnaire called the PHQ-2. This is um, for depression. And there are um, longer versions, most commonly the PHQ-9. But in order to keep you know, screening brief, especially in uh, faster paced settings like primary care settings, where um, here I'm going to present the PHQ-2. Um, as you can see here, this is asking questions for over the last two weeks. So over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by any of the following problems? And um, little interest or pleasure in doing things and feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. So the answer choice is here, um, not at all, several days, more than half a day, nearly every day, or from zero to three. So you could see that um, each, um, to total the score, a score of 
greater than or equal to three indicates that the adolescent should be evaluated for depression by a professional. So whether in the brief intervention you have, uh, you know, if you're having a mental health um, worker deliver the brief intervention, is trained to do so, um, that's great. Otherwise, um, a possible referral to um, a social worker or counselor um, or um, from any mental health services. And this one is for anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder 2, or GAD2. Um, this is all, there's also a longer version. This is the first two questions of the GAD7. And this is actually very often combined with the PHQ2, and together this actually referred to as the PHQ4. So this asks, over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by any of the following problems? As you can see, this is very similar to the PHQ2. Feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge. Not being able to stop or control worrying. And once again, not at all sure, several days, over half the days, and nearly every day. So these scores, um, this is totaled, and once again, as the same as the PHQ2, a score of greater than or equal to 3 indicates that the adolescent should be evaluated for generalized anxiety disorder by a professional. And um, it's the score on these two questions that's greater than or equal to 3. So if, this, um, if it's coupled with the PHQ-2 and you're then using the PHQ-4, uh, the two questions on depression, a score of greater than or equal to 3, indicates that an, uh, an adolescent should be evaluated for depression. And if the adolescent score is greater than or equal to 3 on these two questions, the two anxiety questions, then that indicates that the adolescent should be evaluated for a generalized anxiety disorder. Now, just to wrap up, there's um, confidentiality always comes up as an issue, um, especially when um, trying to refer out for um, substance abuse treatment. So I'm just going to briefly um, talk about this, and that um, settings um, are, you know, are often determined what settings to expert in based on um, you know, levels of confidentiality. So medical settings provide confidentiality under HIPAA. So as I was saying, I mean, there are uh, a number of concerns of providing expert as substance abuse. I mean, alcohol is, is uh, used as um, illegal, and of course, so is drug use. So the issue is notifying parent, parents of serious problems. So that's very important to do when there is a problem, especially if a referral to treatment is necessary. Uh, if um, sites are billing insurance, often an explanation of benefits is sent home, and the parent will receive that in order to bill the insurance. And then, of course, referral to treatment, so providing um, services outside the setting and could possibly breach confidentiality. So other settings, such as schools, don't get, guarantee confidentiality. That all depends on how the school would set things up because they are not covered by HIPAA. And um, you know, when you're also there are issues with who is providing the intervention. So if it's you know a teacher or even you know, a police officer under the DARE program. It's really, um, uh, you know, it, will the adolescent actually um, uh, admit having any issues or be open to discuss versus a medical provider um, with expertise and, and health concerns as well as covered under HIPAA in the medical setting. So in terms of schools, um, there are options to consider um, school-based health centers, which are primary care clinics located in schools. Um, it's a great option, but a lot. Most schools do not have them. And then another option is school-linked health centers, which actually have primary care settings with uh, agreements with schools so that students can then um, get services at those that can serve more schools. And it can also serve the community. So it can serve the parents. It can also serve uh, students who are often absent from school, as well as adolescents who have dropped out of school. Um, so there are a number of options, and these thoughts um, and concerns have to be addressed um, in the uh, pre-implementation stage to determine uh, what sites to go into with expert, and also um, in making changes once implementation has begun to try to address any issues with confidentiality. So as you uh, may have seen those small numbers um, throughout the um, uh, the presentation on the slide, 
These are the references that correspond, and the slides will be available. So if you want to take a look at any of the references, they are available. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to contact me or Dr. McPherson. So at this point, I guess we can take some questions. I have one come in through the chat box. Um, it looks like Pam asked, can you speak to the challenge of adolescents not wanting to admit to any use, resulting in a lot of negative screens? Yeah, well, um, a lot of um, some of the research has shown that um, adolescents will be open and honest to discuss their use and are willing to discuss this with the provider, um, and also that in some ways of administration do result in higher levels of honesty, uh, more self-administered and computer uh, self-administered um, ensure more honesty than maybe a face-to-face -face interview. And it also is dependent on who is giving the interview and also the provide the ensuring of the confidentiality. And uh, some of the projects that um, I've conducted with colleagues, uh, the uh, providers have said that they have um, they've done face-to-face -face interviews and they've um, the adolescents open up and become honest as they continue to ensure the confidentiality. Um, of course, I mean, most, the majority of the screens with adolescents will be negative, and, you know, especially with the younger adolescents, but um, there will always be adolescents who will not be, um, you know, willing to be honest. But, you know, in, in all the, um, you know, feedback that we've, in the research has shown that adolescents are willing to be honest. Okay, one just came in from Jerry. Are there EBP brief interventions for individuals identified with depression and or general anxiety? And if so, what are they? Um, thank you for the question, Jerry. And um, the, uh, the answer is that, um, you know, in terms of uh, this being an intervention for substance use, in our programs, we actually use the PHQ-2, and I'm aware of other um, programs that use the CRAFT along with the, um, the PHQ-4. And um, because, you know, as I said, this is a substance use intervention, we recommend that our staff delivering the brief intervention uh, simply provide a referral for mental health services. So often, um, the, uh, the sites have mental health workers on site so they could then uh, be referred to the mental health worker. For those that don't, they have referral agreements and then can provide um, that referral outside of their site to uh, mental health centers which have the evidence-based practices. As, um, you know, in the field of substance use, I'm not um, in the knowledge and the know of what the evidence-based mental health or what the depression and anxiety interventions are. All right, another question did come in from Carrie. Uh, can you talk about who is doing the screenings and brief interventions in different settings, and are you billing for these services? Uh, well, it varies on, um, on the site and um, in the workflow, so it's really an individual decision. And the, the screening can be done in, by various individuals, and it can also be done self-administered as part of a registration package. Um, it can be done, you know, at the kiosk um, when a you know, patient comes into the office. Um, and uh, it can be done by um, medical office assistants. It can be done by nurses, nurse practitioners. Um, and uh, it, it can be done by the same person who does the brief intervention. And the brief intervention is often done um, by nurses, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants, also done by mental health workers, such as social workers. And um, it can be, the screening can be done by one individual and handed off um, for a brief intervention um, to another individual. And uh, for follow-up appointments, if it's um, deemed that an adolescent needs um, 
more intensive intervention, additional brief intervention sessions that could be handed off to someone else as well with more, um, you know, the social work background or the mental health background. Um, so as I said, this is something that's worked out you know, pre-implementation, um, a workflow analysis is conducted and um, it's determined who's best to, um, uh, to do each intervention. And um, billing um, is uh, that is being um, done in some um, in some of the sites that I've worked um, with with my colleagues. Um, there has been some billing, and um, it really depends on um, you know which type of site you're in if it's a billable site. But um, they have received reimbursement for the screening and brief intervention. Great. Um, it doesn't look like any other questions have come in at this point. Um, there is the contact information up on the screen for future questions, as well as if you have questions, you can always email us at info at iretta.org. That's I-N-F-O at iretta, I-R-E-T-A dot O-R-G. Well, if there are any last-minute thoughts, I can do those. Otherwise, I want to thank everyone for attending today. All right, great. Well, all of the attendees, you'll receive a few follow-up emails from us with the PowerPoints and links to the recordings, that type of thing. And let us know if you have any questions. Thank you for joining us today.